On the 2nd of September 1939, the day after Hitler invaded Poland, the Irish government declared a state of emergency. The Emergency Power Act 1939 was passed. This gave the government new powers such as internment, censorship of the press and correspondence, and government control of the economy. These powers could be used for the duration of the state of emergency. The new act was almost universally supported by the population and the new powers it afforded the government were used liberally. The government also decided that neutrality was the best stance to adopt, a stance which was widely supported by the general population. Although it was worth noting that many Irishmen left to fight for the Allied countries and that many women left to work in factories and hospitals in the UK. The Irish government's pursuit of neutrality meant not showing any preference to either side. This policy can be viewed by the Axis or Allied powers as favouring one over the other, but it is undeniable that the Allied powers benefited more from Ireland's neutrality. An interesting point to note is that many Irish people would have seen the British as their natural enemy, having fought and won independence from Britain some 18 years previously. Many Irish people would have in fact had a certain respect for the Germans who attempted to supply the rebels of the 1916 Rising with arms and ammunition prior to the Rising. The IRA were also active during the emergency, posing the greatest threat to Ireland at the beginning of the war. They attempted to work with the Abwehr for mutual gain, however the government's policy of internment crippled the IRA and they were largely non-effective for the duration of the war. In June 1940, to encourage the neutral Irish state to join the Allies, Winston Churchill indicated to the Taoiseach, Eamon de Valera, that the United Kingdom would push for Irish unity. But believing that Churchill could not deliver, de Valera declined the offer. The British did not inform the government of Northern Ireland that they had made this offer, and de Valera's rejection was not published until 1970. When Gardaí discovered plans for Operation Green, a proposed German invasion of Ireland, joint plans of action were drafted up between the two countries. From December 1940 onwards, Ireland agreed to take in 2,000 British women and children evacuated because of the Blitz. Over 200 of these refugees would be orphaned children. Attacks on Irish shipping that the British had attributed to the Germans were found out to have been carried out by British forces when the presence of British ordnance was found embedded in the ships. Britain later admitted full responsibility. An example of this would have been the attack on the Curlogue by a Polish night fighter squadron. The British were allowed to mine St George's Channel as close to seven miles from Dungarvan. London was informed of U-boat sightings. The Donegal Corridor was open to Allied air traffic, allowing for a more direct route between the Atlantic and Northern Ireland by flying over County Donegal rather than around it. This corridor was used by the plane that sighted the Bismarck. The Irish Air Corps shot down dozens of British barrage balloons. The decision to go ahead with the D-Day landings relied in part on a weather report from County Mayo. Allied air and naval crews that were discovered in Ireland were interred. They were allowed to leave the internment camp to socialise on a regular basis and many escaped to Northern Ireland during this period of leave. Axis sailors and airmen were also interred under the same rules as the Allied internees. The embassies of Japan and Germany remained open. In July 1940, three German Abwehr agents were arrested outside Skibbereen. The agent's mission had been to infiltrate Britain via Ireland. The chief Abwehr spy in Ireland was Hermann Gortz. Approximately 12 spies were deployed, mostly with little success. Gortz would kill himself in 1947 when he learned that he was going to be deported to Germany. The Abwehr agents attempted to get in contact with the IRA and get the IRA to ally with them. Nearly, if not all, of these agents were caught and interned alongside members of the IRA. The German ambassador had his radio confiscated in 1943 to stop him passing on message to his superiors. The U-boat torpedo attack which sank the vessel SS Irish Oak on the 19th of May 1943. De Valera said that it was a wanton and inexcusable act. There was no possibility of a mistake. The conditions of visibility were good and the neutral markings on the ships were clear. There was no warning given. Multiple alleged accidental bombings by the German Luftwaffe. Repeated attempts to offer captured British war equipment in exchange for an allegiance with the Axis. One of the most controversial acts of the war from an Irish perspective was de Valera offering sympathies to the German people on the death of Adolf Hitler. Sir John Maffey, the British representative, commented that de Valera's actions were unwise but mathematically consistent in relation to a neutral country offering condolences to the people of a nation at war. 
The first bombing of neutral Ireland by German aircraft during the Second World War occurred on the 26th of August 1940, when bombs destroyed a creamery at Camp Pyle, County Wexford, killing three people. The first three days of January 1941 saw more bombings, including three deaths caused by a bombing of a house in Boris County Carlow. Other areas bombed included Kildare, Loud, Mead, Wexford and Wicklow. On successive nights, the 2nd and 3rd of January 1941, German bombs were dropped for the first time on Dublin City. The excuse for most of the bombing was that the Luftwaffe pilots had confused Ireland for England, but Ireland had limited blackout regulations and as such towns and cities would have been clearly illuminated, unlike the UK. Meanwhile, Northern Ireland was at war and the Harlan and Wolf shipyards in Belfast were among the strategic targets for German attacks. The Luftwaffe carried out bombing raids on Belfast on the 7th of April 1941. Eight people died. On the 15th of April 1941, 180 Luftwaffe bombers attacked Belfast. Over 200 tonnes of explosives, 80 landmines attached to parachutes and 800 firebomb canisters were dropped. Over 1,000 died and 56,000 houses were damaged, leaving 100,000 temporarily homeless. At 4.30am, Basil Brook asked Dave Valera for assistance. Within two hours, 13 fire tenders from Dublin, Drogheda, Dundalk and Dunleary were on their way to cross the Irish border to assist their Belfast colleagues. De Valera followed this up with the They Are Our People speech. Although there was a later raid on the 4th of May, it was confined to the docks and shipyards. On the night of the 31st of May 1941, Four high explosive bombs were dropped by German aircraft on the North Strand area of Dublin City. The casualties were many, 34 dead and 90 injured, with 300 houses damaged or destroyed. This bombing was interpreted as a reprisal for the assistance given to Belfast during the Blitz. While in Britain, Churchill is seen as a hero, he was not a fan of Irish nationalism, and as such was not a popular figure in Ireland. He was the mastermind behind the Gallipoli campaign that saw the Irish regiments involved take heavy casualties. He also supported the Black and Tans, an organisation synonymous with violence and oppression in this country. Churchill also negotiated against the Irish delegation for the Anglo-Irish Treaty in his capacity as Secretary of State for the Colonies. In 1938, Chamberlain renounced Britain's right to the three Irish deep water ports in order to secure the goodwill of de Valera. The treaty ports, as they were known, were of great interest to Churchill, who was very keen on the use of Ireland's airfields and ports in order to further Britain's position in the war. De Valera was vehemently against this idea, even when Churchill did allude to supporting Irish unity if Britain were to be allowed access to these resources. Churchill grew to strongly resent De Valera over the course of the war. Most of this hatred seemed to stem from Ireland's stance of neutrality and lack of interest in fighting the German war machine that had swept most of Europe. It affected him so much that in one of his speeches after VE Day in 1945, what should have been his finest hour, he proceeded to express his contempt for de Valera and Ireland. It is also worth noting that Eamon de Valera is a hugely controversial figure in Irish history, and anyone who has even a passing interest in the Irish history of the 20th century would know the reasons behind this. The sense of envelopment, which might at any moment turn to strangulation, lay heavy upon us. We had only the northwestern approach, between Ulster and Scotland, through which to bring in the means of life and to send out the forces of war. Owing to the action of Mr. de Valera, so much at variance with the temper and instinct of thousands of southern Irishmen who hastened to the battlefront to prove their ancient valour, the approaches which the uh, southern Irish ports and airfields could so easily have guarded were closed by the hostile aircraft and U-boats. This was indeed a deadly moment in our life. And if it had not been for the loyalty and friendship of Northern Ireland, we should have come to, we should have been forced to come to close quarters with Mr. de Valera or perish forever from the earth. However, with the restraint and poise to which I say a history will find few parallels, His Majesty's government never laid a violent hand upon them, though at times it would have been quite easy and quite natural. 
and we left the de Valera government to frolic with the Germans and later with the Japanese representatives to their heart's content. Allowances can be made for Mr. Churchill's statement, however unworthy, in the first flush of his victory. No such excuse can be found for me in this quiet atmosphere. There are, however, some things which it is my duty to say, some things which it is essential to say. I shall try to say them as dispassionately as I can. Mr. Churchill makes it clear that in certain circumstances he would have violated our neutrality and that he would justify his action by Britain's necessity. It seems strange to me that Mr. Churchill does not see that this, if accepted, would mean that Britain's necessity would become a moral code. And that when this necessity was sufficiently great, other people's rights were not to count. It is quite true that other great powers believe in this same code in their own regard and have behaved in accordance with it. That is precisely why we have the disastrous successions of wars. World War number one, World War number two, and shall it be World War number three? Surely Mr. Churchill must see that if his contention be admitted in our regard, a like justification can be framed for similar acts of aggression elsewhere, and no small nation adjoining a great power could ever hope to be permitted to go its own way in peace. It is indeed fortunate that Britain's necessity did not reach the point when Mr. Churchill would have acted. All credit to him that he successfully resisted the temptation, which I have no doubt many times assailed him in his difficulties, and to which I freely admit many leaders might have easily succumbed. It is indeed hard for the strong to be just to the weak, but acting justly always has its rewards. By resisting his temptation in this instance, Mr. Churchill, instead of adding another horrid chapter to the already blood-stained record of the relations between England and this country, has advanced the cause of international morality, an important step, one of the most important indeed that can be taken on the road to the establishment of any sure basis for peace. Mr. Churchill is proud of Britain's stand alone after France had fallen and before America entered the war. Could he not find it in his heart, the generosity to acknowledge that there is a small nation that stood alone, not for one year or two, but for several hundred years against aggression, that endured spoliations, famines, massacres in endless succession, that was clubbed many times into insensibility, but that each time on returning consciousness took up the fight anew, a small nation that could never be got to accept defeat and has never surrendered her soul. This video has only been a brief overview of Ireland's involvement in World War II and what the emergency in Ireland was. We have not touched on the Irish Mercantile Navy, Irish-American relations, Ireland and the Holocaust, the Irish Army, or those who fought for the British were treated on their return home. While we will be hoping to cover these topics in later videos, if you would like to know more at this immediate time, you can do so by listening to or reading the sources used to create this video.